All right, let's get started with this week's live code. Uh, I hope all of you are doing well and staying safe. I can't believe it's actually the end of May, so it's it's really kind of surreal that we've been in the state for a while now. So I hope all of you are staying safe, all of you are um, staying safe and practicing social distancing. Anyway, so this this week's topic, this week's live code topic is on libsodium, which is also called NACL, right? Salt. Uh, so uh, libsodium is what we're going to be talking about today. And I want to give you a little bit of a background on libsodium before we do that and uh, then get into what this is all about. So let's uh, quickly look at a little bit of the, uh, let's get some logistics out of the way before we actually get into the uh, cast itself. So my name is Abhay. Uh, uh, if you if you know me, you've been seeing that we've been doing a lot of these sessions online. Uh, I run a company called We45. I head technology at We45, typically do a lot of, uh, uh, especially automation and of course, more on the lines of uh, We45's cloud security and some of these newer initiatives around cloud security and technology is something I head. I also train uh, at a lot of events like Black Hat, DEF CON, uh, OASP as well. So in fact, uh, this year we have two upcoming trainings at Black Hat, which is one in Black Hat USA. And we've also recently been selected uh, to deliver our DevSecOps workshop at Black Hat EU. So yay for that. Uh, of course, we have other trainings at OASP as well. I think we have a couple of trainings that are slated uh, in OASP SF uh, in October. So if you're in that event and if you want to speak with us, please let us know. We can uh, catch up on a lot of these different events. Now, before we get started, as always, we are doing a lot of awesome virtual training. Uh, virtual training is available uh, on these topics specifically. Uh, these are the upcoming ones. One is our DevSecOps Masterclass, which is our probably our most popular training uh, on DevSecOps. And you will see that you will get a great deal of knowledge on DevSecOps as well as automation, as well as AppSec. How do you embed all of these different AppSec automation scenarios and AppSec automation practices in your SDL and as part of your DevOps pipeline. So we're giving these away practically at extremely uh, extremely uh, value-driven prices. So you should definitely take a look at it, both DevSecOps Masterclass and these two are our extremely popular courses. So tagging and defending containers, Kubernetes and serverless, we've added a lot of labs as well. So do be a part of this. Not only do you get this, but you also get live training. You get access to labs after the training, you get access to videos after the training, and you get certification as well. So it's pretty awesome. Uh, when you when you do this particular course, you can just go over to store.we45.com. That's store.we45.com, and you should be able to uh, select the course of your choice and get started with the date of your choice. So. That's essentially out of the way. Um, we are, like I said, also running a bunch of trainings at events. Now, most of these events have become virtual, but if you are interested in some of these events, you should join our trainings at these events. Black Hat US, we actually have two trainings uh, this time, DevSecOps, four days. In fact, it's going to be an intense training. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, as well as our uh, Kubernetes Security Masterclass with a dedicated Kubernetes attack and defense course. So if you're into that sort of thing, uh, Black Hat, you should look at this. Uh, we are, I think Black Hat has discounted the rates quite a bit and it's doing it entirely virtual. So you don't have to spend all of that money traveling to Vegas. Now you can do it from the comfort of your home. So it's pretty interesting stuff that we're doing for all of these different events over the course of the next two or three, uh, no, not um, over the course of the next four or five months now. So you will see us in all these events. Uh, Echo Party as well. So we are doing a bunch of training at Echo Party Argentina, which is, I'm really looking forward to that. It's the first time training at Echo Party. So that's something we're doing. All right. So with that out of the way, let's get started with what I want to talk about today. So what I want to really talk about is, so the reason I had this idea for this live code session was because of the, the training that I've been doing so far. So recently, I've been doing a lot of training on secrets management, encryption, and so on for a bunch of clients uh, for We45. So uh, I've been doing a lot of research. I've been doing a lot of reading. I've also been doing a lot of uh, writing demos and stuff like that. So it's been an interesting process uh, doing this. So one of the things that uh, I really love, especially uh, with our industry is the ability to do something called secure defaults. Now, 
one of the things that secure defaults does is that it essentially questions the fact that hey why do we even need to train developers on these to, to how to make certain things much more secure when we can give them secure default libraries that they can use uh, which don't even allow them to do anything insecure or gives them very little room to do things that are explicitly insecure so let me give you an example of that so previously uh, probably early in the 2000s you would have probably seen sql injection was rampant still is to a certain extent but you've definitely seen that sql injection has uh, reduced right uh, i've definitely seen that uh, i don't know if you have but you i have definitely seen that sql injection has definitely reduced it's taken uh, it's taken a nose dive when it comes to a lot of different types of applications especially in ruby apps or node js apps or uh, python apps and so on and so forth and newer apps that are being built you hardly see sql injection the reason for that is because a lot of orm libraries and secure defaults have been created that will essentially not or hardly allow a developer to introduce these flaws right so developer even without thinking about it the developer is doing something secure by default and that's the critical part of secure default so that's something that you should keep in mind so secure defaults is really uh, about you know uh, creating the right behavior rather than teaching them complex way to not screw up stuff right so that's basically what secure defaults is all about uh, so this has seen some level of success with secrets with crypto with authentication authorization injections injection sorry injections uh, injection cross site scripting so we've seen some level of success with all of these things and one quote that i really like uh, from google's uh, tink library google has a crypto library called tink which is a secure default misuse resistant library so they say that using crypto in your application shouldn't have to feel like juggling chainsaws in the dark right now this i think rings true to me because hey i am a developer i am not a cryptographer i i yes i understand cryptography to the extent of how to uh, use a library and implement it but i am not i should not be expected to understand the underlying issue that comes with the rsa library rsa encryption standard or i should not have to think about okay am i using the right mode of encryption for this uh, piece of data that i want to encrypt i should be able to use a crypto library without having to worry about all of these different issues without having to consider all of these different issues unfortunately we still see that a lot of libraries still give you access to a ton of bad patterns and uh, insecure functionality which makes it very difficult for you to achieve you know this kind of uh, capability but today we are seeing the rise of a lot of these libraries like google tink google tink is one of these libraries and i'm really happy to see that you are seeing that in other areas as well sql injection cross site scripting other flaws as well you are seeing that secure default libraries are are making uh, definite uh, and they're, they're definitely adding a lot of value to developers and companies and in fact uh, if you listen to clint gibbler's awesome talk in appsec cali 2020 he uh, about devsecops and scaling application security he essentially says that uh, secure defaults have been uh, you know uh, one of the biggest ways that companies have achieved security at scale so i definitely subscribe to that i think it's a very valid point and a valid opinion to have so that's really about secure defaults so when it comes to crypto what am i expecting from something that is considered secure defaults right so i want my crypto libraries to be strong algorithms only i don't want to have to even think about implementing a weak algorithm i don't want to, uh, i don't want my crypto library to even give me access to doing things with md5 or sha1 right so let's say i want to hash something i shouldn't be even allowed to use md5 or sha1 i should only be given blake2 or some other uh, let's say sha256 with salts uh, to ensure that i i do hashing correctly or if i'm doing encryption that library should not even allow me to use des or triple des or something like that because hey these are bad i should only be allowed to use aes and it should automatically revert to the most secure mode like aes gcm or mo other more secure mode of encryption i don't have to think about padding i don't have to think about all of those things it should also be easy to use right now when i do encryption a lot of times i've seen that you need to think about okay what's the padding i need to use what is the nonce of salt i need to have what is the initialization vector i need to use uh, whether it's random enough is it secure enough is it not secure enough it's a lot of work i do not want to think about that as developers we are not again uh, I, i'm sure you'll understand that developers are not exactly 
uh, won't have the not only the time but may not even have the wherewithal to sit and learn all these things from scratch. So I want to be able to use these libraries without having to deal with the massive blowback that comes with screwing them up later. So I want to deal with more secure, misuse, resistant libraries, and that's really what we want to talk about here. So two libraries that really help us do that, and I'm going to look at the second one. So Libsod, uh, Google Stink uh, previously was only a Java library, but now has support for Python, JavaScript, Golang, C++, and Object C. Uh, Libsodium uh, is, I think, an older library. It's implemented in C, but it has a ports in multiple languages. And I'm going to look at the Python port, uh, because obviously Python port, uh, I really like uh, you know coding in Python, especially for these live codes. So, uh, I'm going to look at Libsodium, and I'm going to look at Python's uh, one of Python's libraries for Libsodium, which is called Pynacl, Py N A C L, uh, and I'm going to look at that, and we're going to see how that works. All right, so let's get started with our live code itself. So I'm going to uh, quickly uh, share some information about Libsodium. So Libsodium is uh, documented reasonably well in this or in this uh, URL. So it's uh, really nice. You can check it out. It's This is the URL for Libsodium. In fact, it has a lot of different the ways in which you can use it. Now, one of the things I really like about Libsodium is that it's, uh, it's very easy to use. It does not make you think about things that you don't want to think about. It just makes you implement the most secure variant as the default. And it does not even give you access to doing more insecure things that you would do. So let me give you a bad example and a good example, right? So I'm going to pull up a bad example from a piece of code that uh, we were working on with one of our labs in the AppSec class. And I'm going to show you the bad example that I'm talking about. Just a second. Yeah, so here we are, the bad example. Now, if you see this example, uh, I'm going to, I probably need to just drill in a little bit. Yeah, if you see this example, you'll see what I'm talking about. First of all, this example, uh, first of all, we are uh, there are a bunch of security flaws. But uh, let me explain that the things that I am talking about from a developer usability standpoint. The first thing uh, that I'm doing here is I am trying to use AES uh, encryption to do this. And this is obviously not, while AES is fine, the mode that I'm using to encrypt uh, my data is not great. right? Uh, ECB mode is, is considered insecure simply because you have identical plain text generating identical ciphertext. So ECB is considered the most insecure mode of encryption. So the very fact that this library allows me to do this is something that is not secure by default, right? The very fact that this library mode underscore allows me to do mode underscore ECB means that it's probably a fail from that perspective. The other thing that you see I'm doing is that I'm also padding the library. I'm, I'm also using padding, things like I'm padding it. I'm also giving, uh, I'm also including in the case of, let us say I was using some other mode of encryption. I would also have to think about the initialization vector. I would have to do all those things. And in this case, I've hard coded the key. So things like this are not really secure because these come from very standard cryptographic libraries that give me access to anything I can do. AES, uh, any mode, I can do probably even triple dash or blowfish or some other a slightly weaker cipher. Um, I also have access to a lot of different hashing algorithms with these uh, insecure defaults like MD5, SHA1, and so on, which I should not have to deal with, right? As a developer, I don't know more DCB. I have not been taught, okay, what's the issue with more DCB? Maybe uh, if I go, go through a bunch of security classes, maybe yes, but a lot of times I may not have gone through these security classes. So this is the problem that we have. I don't know what padding is. I don't know what padding to use. I don't know what padding should be. I'm not a cryptographer. I, I have no clue about what padding is. I may understand the concept of padding, but implementing padding is something that I may not want to do because, hey, have I done it right? Have I done it wrong? Is this padding OK? Is this not OK? I really don't know. So we have all of those issues that come into play as well. So you see that this is an example that is a classically non uh, on an anti pattern to what I'm going to be talking about today. So Libsodium is essentially, like I said, a uh, misuse. I, I wouldn't say misuse resistant, although it, because it does not advertise that in its, uh, you know, in its documentation, but it essentially is supposed to be oriented towards secure defaults, usability and speed, right? 
So that's what they claim. But I also think it's quite misuse resistant because they don't even give you the ability to do things in an insecure way all at once. Right? In most cases, you can't do things in an insecure way unless you specifically set out to do it in an explicitly insecure way. So let's look at what I'm talking about uh, and implement some code and actually see what I'm talking about at the sodium. So I'm going to do three examples here. I'm going to look at uh, symmetric encryption where we use a single key. I'm going to I'm also going to look at asymmetric encryption, and I'm also going to look at password hashing. So we're going to look at three use cases. We're going to look at symmetric encryption, asymmetric encryption, and we're going to look at password hashing in this live code. And you'll see what I'm talking about. So first of all, let's look at the algorithms that Libsodium supports in when you're doing symmetric encryption, right? Symmetric encryption, remember, the same key is used to encrypt, the same key is used to decrypt. So that's basically what you're doing, except that you're passing it through a crypto system. And you'll see that the uh, the, the, the constructions that are allowed uh, when you're doing symmetric encryption are only authenticated encryption, right? Which means that not only is are you encrypting, but you're also uh, generating some kind of authentication tag that is verified when you're decrypting it. So that's essentially what you're doing. So you're encrypting with authentication, which is a probably the best way to do things when you're doing encryption. And if you see Lipsodium, it only supports very specific, highly secure algorithms. It does not support anything and everything under the sun. It does not support DES or triple DES and all these other algorithms, which are known insecure. It only supports IES-256. It supports SHA-20, uh, Poly-1305 and multiple variants of that, which are quite secure, right? So you can see uh, all of this in the encryption. So let's look at uh, how we can implement uh, Libsodium in our own um, application, right? So I'm going to open up an editor. Sorry about that. I think I opened it in the wrong directory. And let's open live.py, okay? So I'm going to write some code, and we're going to look at how we can introduce. So let's first import the libraries that we need. I'm going to import the libraries that we need. So I'm going to use the Python um, Pinnacle uh, library. So I'm going to import, uh, import these libraries. So I'm going to say nacl.secret and nacl.utils. Uh, so these are the two libraries I need. So the first thing I want to do is generate a key, right? So I'm not using a user's data set as a key. I want to generate a key. So I'm going to generate a key with Libsodium itself, right? So nacl.utils.random. Uh, NSL dot secret dot secret box dot key size. So this generates a random value which is of a certain key length, right? So it gives you a certain key size and it generates this as a key. Now this is the best way to do things simply because you don't have to. Uh, you are not really thinking about. Uh, you're not really thinking about using the user's data as the key or something like that. You're essentially generating a strong key to begin with. Now, the other cool thing about Libsodium is that it gives you simple terms to understand things, right? So let's look at this uh, this line of code that I'm going to write. So NACL dot secret dot secret box, which means you're essentially what you're doing is you are adding, you're creating like a safe and you are you're adding your key to that safe, which you're going to use to encrypt and decrypt stuff. So you can see that it's very intuitive to understand these kind of APIs, right? So you're not really thinking about, uh, okay, this is encryption, you're doing padding, you need to use this key, you need to use IV, you, do, you need to use knots. You're not thinking the term, the terminology, the, the ease of use, it's extremely usable simply because you're you are thinking like how a person would actually, uh, and let me just finish this, I think I'm going to have to, um, Otherwise, Visual Studio Code is going to keep constantly irritating me. I'm going to have to install Flake it. Let me just install it. Let's Flake it Visual Studio by installing Flake it. So, so what this is doing is uh, essentially uh, we're adding a key uh, here to the secret box, which is like your vault. Okay, so let's uh, have our message. So the message is launch Operation Firestorm. So it sounds pretty cool. Sounds interesting. Sounds official. Let's launch that. I want to encrypt this message, obviously. So the encrypted text is essentially this, right? So you have the encrypted value, which is box. Now, remember, you have a safe, 
So you're essentially sending the plain text. Imagine that you're sending the plain text to the safe and it is going to encrypt this value of message, right? So I'm encrypting this byte array um, called uh, message and it's going to encrypt it. I'm also going to, for the sake of, you know, encoding it correctly, I can encode this. I can actually do this base 64 b 64 encode. All right, and I'm going to print this and encrypt it. And let's run this piece of code. I'm going to. So we have Python. Py, and you'll see that we have our encrypted data set. Now here, you'll realize that I didn't bother selecting the algorithm. I didn't bother selecting the IV. I didn't bother selecting the, uh, I didn't do any of that. Right? I just went on with it. I wrote encryption and I was able to get encryption up and running in a few seconds, simply because I didn't have to think about all of that different stuff. I generated a key with what it said was uh, good enough random size. I used a secret box, which was uh, what it uses for you know, symmetric encryption. And I just encrypted some data and I rendered it, right? So in this case, if you see, uh, yeah. Uh, so if you see uh, what we're doing, it just makes it a little uh, easier to work with rather than very, very standard way of doing things where you have to select the algorithm, the key, the padding and all of that stuff, which makes it a little bit more complicated to work. Right. So um, let's decrypt this now. Let's look at the decryption aspect of this. And I'm going to just uh, add the decryption. So let's uh, so this encryption encrypted value, you can encrypt it. Of course, you can add your own nonce. So let's say you want to control certain things like initialization vector. You can add your own nonce, but I it, it automatically does that. That's the point of using secure default. You will see that you can add, um, you can do this by default without having to deal with all that complexity, right? So that's the beauty of using secure default. So let's decrypt this data set now. So I'm gonna say plain text, uh, let's print the base 64 dot d64 encode version of the uh, encrypted value. And then I'm going to generate a plain text, which is essentially going to be decrypting it. So I'm going to say box dot decrypt. Um, and essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass the encrypted cipher text to this. And hopefully we should get our plain text. Right. So let's, um, so in this case, I'm just going to say cipher text. And in this case, I'm going to say, right, let's run this. So you see that? So it was really simple to do because I didn't have to think about all of this stuff, right? I, I, I'm i using a library called Salsa20, uh, which automatically does authenticated encryption. It does AEAD or authenticated encryption. And Salsa 20 uh, is, is considered secure. It's not AES, it's a different library, it's a different algorithm that I'm using. It's developed by the, I think the original author of Libsodium also is the author or one of the authors of Salsa 20, uh, Daniel Bernstein. So uh, Salsa 20 is the one we're using here. Of course, I think certain versions of Libsodium also has the ability to do AES keys or AES encryption. But I, I don't think this has been implemented in the Python variant, so I'm using Salsa 20. But the idea here, as you can see, is I'm not doing anything that is inherently insecure and insecure by default. I am essentially not having to deal with all of the complexity of choosing the library, choosing the algorithm, or choosing even the mode that I'm encrypting with. I'm just going ahead and getting it done. And I'm encrypting and getting value out of this process very, very quickly. So this is. Uh, you know, secret key encryption or what they call secret key encryption, which is symmetric encryption. So you can also do other things. So let's look at another use case, which is password hashing. Right now, password hashing, uh, one of the things that I constantly like to talk about in password hashing is the fact that people um, today, password hashes are not really, hashes are not really good enough to uh, 
hold back attackers, right? We're seeing that even hashing with SHA-256 or in even uh, what is not broken hashing algorithms like SHA-256 or SHA-512, we are seeing that hashing is not holding up uh, against a lot of attacks that we're seeing. So even if you salt it, right? So if you salt it, you have to store the salt along with the hash and somebody can uh, perform, a, uh, you know, can crack the hash either using rainbow tables or some other approach. Now, the, the problem with using typical hashes to protect passwords is that a hashing process is inherently uh, fast or inherently a high speed operation to generate, right? To generate a hash is very, very fast. And as you can see that the attacker, when the attacker is trying to compromise your hash, the attacker is also going at an equivalent, uh, uh, you know, as an, at an equivalent pace. Uh, so you can see that the hash uh, can be compromised very quickly. So especially if you're not enforcing any kind of secure password or secure, uh, I mean, a strong password length or password complexity and stuff like that, it gets much easier for an attacker to compromise your password uh, because you're using hashes. Now, one of the approaches to uh, doing that is using key stretching algorithms. Now, key stretching algorithms essentially use either a combination, they still hash, but they use hash along with things like HMAC or along with things like uh, uh, encryption algorithm like Blowfish, for instance, Bcrypt uses an encryption algorithm like Blow, uh, Blowfish to do uh, to generate the hash. And now, so they use the hash, a hashing algorithm or the hashing function. They use either HMAC or a cryptographic, uh, crypto, crypto, sorry, cryptographic algorithm to do this. Along with that, they also use salts uh, to add some uh, layer of randomization for that, and they round it out as well multiple hundred uh, or you know ten thousand times. So, for instance, let's say I use PBKDF to hash a password. Now, PBKDF uses uh, a key derivation function with an HMAC SHA-256 or SHA-512, depending on what you want to use. And let's say I uh, generate ten thousand rounds. Obviously, that will result in that hash generating much slower than a typical, you know, integrity-driven or integrity focused hash would be uh, generated. So the idea here is that you're slow hashing the whole process. So as you're slow hashing the whole process, you are also slow hashing the, uh, you, the attacker is also forced to go at that slow pace to be able to uh, compromise your hashes. And of course, there are better hashes, the better uh, key stretching algorithms like Argon2 and Bcrypt, which make things a little bit more difficult than other algorithms like maybe PVKDF2. So, uh, Okay, I have a couple of uh, comments here uh, from Chrysalis and Raghuveer. Uh, Lipsodium, Base64, and Hex Codex. Oh, okay, uh, main reason that Python can have side channels. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Lipsodium, Base64, and Hex Codex are not malleable and avoid side channels. Thanks for that. I appreciate that comment. Uh, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, I was not aware of that. So thank you uh, for pointing that out. Curve 25519 digital signature with uh, Paragon. Oh, yeah, the, I've been following some work by Scott Arsazuski. It's really good stuff, Raghuvi. Thanks for that comment. I'm not going to be showcasing digital signature today because you don't have too much time, but thanks for that comment. I really appreciate uh, you know, the, the interaction uh, today. Yes, that's absolutely right. This And I really respect a lot of Scott's work, especially things like uh, uh, he's, he's written a version, not uh, a version of JWT, but he's written a very interesting alternative to the uh, JSON web token uh, standard called Paseto. Uh, I'm going to just paste the link uh, here for uh, this is a very uh, interesting alternative uh, to JWT and uh, Scott essentially uh, talked about it in his DEF CON talk a couple of years ago that I attended. I really found that to be very valuable in my understanding as well. But yeah, thanks for those comments, uh, folks. That was really interesting. Okay, so let's look at what we can do with uh, password hashes, right? So in this case, what I'm going to be doing is generating some password hashes, right? So let's, I'm going to remove whatever I've written here. So I'm going to say import nacl.pw hash. Now, one of the cool things you can do, again, one of the things I like with Libsodium and Tink and all these things is that they automatically give you secure hashing uh, or secure algorithms, secure implementations by default. So uh, in this case, I think in the case of uh, Pinnacle, 
it supports uh, i think it supports argon 2 and it supports script and i think even libsodium supports only those so let me have a look at what they support uh, this is password hashing sorry about that i think password hashing uh, the password hash api so they support argon 2 uh, they do support argon 2 for sure and i think it also supports script if i'm not mistaken uh, so both these two uh, you know standards for key stretching are supported so you'll see that it makes a first of all a differentiation between just hashing something for integrity sake and password hashing so you'll see that hashing itself it just gives you hey when you just want to use generic hashing you can use blake 2b or something like that which is a generic hashing algorithm um, but yeah it, it uses blake 2b uh, but if you want to do password hashing we recommend that you use something like argon 2 so that's something uh, that you can do with lipsodium as well uh, so let's quickly look at the password hashing functionality of Libsodium. So I have a password called password123 horrible password. But nevertheless, yes. uh, so you see that I can do nacl.pwhash.str password. And I think we should have a response of that. So you see, I'm not selected the algorithm at all. I'm not selected, hey, do an argon to whatever it is. You'll see that I'm just saying, hey, password hash this. And it generates an argon to hash by default, right? So it generates an argon to ID hash by default. And this hash is something I can store in my database. And of course, I can validate by uh, matching that particular hash against uh, this. So you can just use uh generate the hash and then i can use nacl.pwhash dot verify and i can pass in that particular password and you'll see that it works so let's actually do that um let's call it hashed and uh we're going to pass in another password called new pass which is going to be password one, two, three, and I'm going to do verify of the hashed password with the new pass. This is so when the user logs in, the user enters password one, two, three. Let's see whether it verifies. Yeah, so it clearly verifies. If I pass obviously the wrong password, it should not verify, and you will see that it is a wrong password. So this, as you can see, makes it really easy for me as a developer uh, uh, to manage uh, password hashing or encryption or digital signature. Or I don't think it supports. Yeah, it supports mutual authentication with uh, public key cryptography as well. So you really have a lot of functionalities. It, again, it, it it may not be as large scoped as a Java bouncy castle provider or a Python crypto provider, but the idea here is that you you do not need that large scope largely, right? In most cases, if you want to go with something secure and tested, you want to go with something that is more uh, specific and secure by default. And that's where libraries like uh libsodium or google stink uh, allow you to do that without having to you know uh, without having you jump through the hoops of understanding all of these things like padding understanding initialization better understanding modes of encryption understanding block ciphers stream ciphers and all that stuff understanding that is good i'm not saying you should not understand it. it's always good to understand things but again to not have to think about it is great for the average developer and this essentially uh, makes that process a whole lot easier for you to do especially when you are dealing with uh, you know especially when you're dealing with critical uh, functionality like cryptography which can go terribly wrong if you get it even a little bit wrong so that's something that you should keep in mind i think we're a little bit over time today so i'm going to stop the live feed and uh, i'm going to see you next week with another one of these, I'm going to announce uh, the topic that we're going to be looking at next week. Uh, thanks for staying in touch and stay tuned for another live code session that's coming up next week. I'll see you next week. Thank you very much. And thanks to all of you who responded on the chat. I really appreciate the comments. And uh, yeah, uh, I'll see you next week. Thank you very much.